Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Preparing Young People to Leave Care During COVID-19. My name is Stuart Muir, I'm the Executive Manager of the Family Policy and Practice Research Program at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting at the AFES office and here at my house in Melbourne. It, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri peoples and also the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today. So today we're talking about young people in Australia's out of home care system and particularly those who are preparing to transition to adulthood. We'll be looking at a few general factors related to leaving care, as well as some of the factors that make care leavers particularly vulnerable during events like COVID-19. To help frame our discussion, we'll also be playing some highlights from two webinars we hosted last year in 2019. So before I introduce today's presenters, I wanted to acknowledge the, contribu the contributors of these past presentations. So first up, we'll be hearing from Paul McDonald, the CEO of Anglicare Victoria and chair of the Home Stretch campaign. And he'll be helping to paint a picture of the out of home care system in Australia and how young people commonly experience leaving care and making the transition to adulthood. We'll also briefly explore what the Australian and international evidence tells us about extending care arrangements. And we'll be using key sections of that same webinar delivered by Paul's co presenter, Philip Mendes of Monash University. Philip's also joining us here today uh, to give some further insights in the context of COVID 19, but I'll, I'll come back to Philip and his proper introduction in a moment. Finally, we'll be showing you some highlights of a webinar we hosted in July 2019 that was presented by myself, Stuart Muir and Jay Patel. And in that webinar, we discussed some of the key findings of the Beyond 18 study, which examined young people's experiences of leaving out of home care in Victoria. Links to all of these presentations are now available on this webinar's event page, as well as on the CFCA website. So, Today's presenters, we're joined, we're very pleased to be joined by two eminent experts in the field, Philip Mendez and Jacinda War. Philip is an Associate Professor and the Director of the Social Inclusion and Social Policy Research Unit in the Department of Social Work at Monash University. Philip's been researching young people living in state care for over 20 years, and today I'll be giving us a brief overview of recent national and international developments relating to the extension of care arrangements and highlighting some of those that have been particularly introduced in response to COVID-19. Philip's colleague Jacinta works in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Monash University as a teaching associate and she's completing her doctoral work examining the influence of informal social supports on the lives of young people leaving care. Jacinta is going to give us an overview of the concept of social capital in the context of leaving care and discuss some of the more some of the reasons why care leavers are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of restricted social contact as we've been experiencing recently. After these presentations, then Philip Jacinta and I will talk a little bit about the research, what the research says about how practitioners can support care leavers and help address and how they might help address some of the vulnerabilities. So without further ado, uh, we will now take a look back through some of the key learnings from the past webinars that I've just introduced. Thanks. Where I thought I'd go first is what is out of home care? And basically out of home care, it refers to statutory care of children and young people who are unable to live with their parents. So children out of home care are in most cases also on, on a care and protection order. They may have been removed due to uh, abuse, neglect or uh, relinquishment reasons. Let's, let's say there's around 50,000 young people who are in out of home care. Most of those are in foster care and kinship care with around five to 6% who are in also residential care. And about a third of those, a bit over a third, uh, are, are children of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent. The target group between 15 and 17 years when the state normally sets about the process of exiting or terminating care. Swinburne University Technology, who did their national survey of homeless youth, found that 63% of them were actually in state care historically and were now homeless. When you have a look at some of the other outcomes, 35% had five or more places of stay in their first 12 months from leaving care. Just under 30% were unemployed, many of them were new parents, and also many, uh, particularly uh, the young men, just uh, around 40 odd percent had been involved in the juvenile justice system, again, within the first 12 months of the care being uh, terminated. 
43%, the AFES report announced yesterday, of 20 to 24 year olds, up from 36%, are still in the family home. Goodness me, 17% of 25 to 29 year olds are still in the family home. Yet, in every state in Australia, legislatively speaking, the care is to be terminated, ended, without discretion, without any discussion, at 18. Now, what does this in fact mean? Well, their work is removed, or, or legal, physical, domestic support is then terminated. So what we've seen is West Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, ACT, New South Wales, Queensland and Northern Territory all universally have their legislation that cares to be finished at 18 and all universally have their care planning requirements are required to begin with a child at 15. Now, can you imagine going up to your own child at 15 and saying, oh, by the way, uh, Johnny, it's uh, we've got to get you a leaving care plan. This is what the state does to children in state care. We went to Deloitte Access Economics and we asked them, could they do a similar cost benefit study state by state and imagine if care was extended to 21, what would be the benefits? Interestingly, the Commonwealth, who does not have jurisdiction over child welfare here in this country, they're paying 1.8 billion over the next 10 years if we continue to have care terminated at 18. That being costs in Centrelink payments, costs in, as due to early pregnancies, costs in hospitalisation, you know, so Deloitte Access Economics has found that if we do not extend care through to 21, the costs to the country will be 2.4 billion. 1.8 billion, uh, the Commonwealth are picking up the check, and 0.6 billion or 600 million for the state and territory. So Deloitte and Access Economics said, on a cost benefit ratio, if we did implement extended care, that is, if we allowed the placement to continue through to 21, and on current figures, and this is on current figures, if around 30% of children who were in care took up the option. Now remember, I'll just detour here a little bit. We're not arguing or suggesting that every child in state care should continue on to 21. Many will choose their own path, many will say, great, I can't wait to get out of here and bang, off I go. But for those who aren't ready, or for those, you know, seven months pregnant, those who got caught next week, those hopelessly unemployed, those on the spectrum order, those who are very well adjusted but aren't very independently ready, for all of those, we uh, could we allow that option for them to remain? Now, Deloitte Access Economics on the economic argument said that, in fact, there's a there's a cost benefit return. There's a return on every one dollar. If one, if a government invested one dollar into extending care, their return will be, well, New South Wales, three dollars forty, Queensland, two dollars sixty-nine, Tasmania, two sixty-nine. As the list goes on, I won't, it's all there in front of you. So there's a return on investment for government. So not only is this producing good social return, but it's producing good economic return for state government. Historically, most countries have provided only limited leaving care or post-care support services. But over the last two decades, there has been growing international awareness of the needs of care leavers and an expectation of ongoing care beyond 18 years of age. Consequently, most of the countries in the OECD and many other jurisdictions have introduced new legislation or expanded, expanded existing laws, policies or programs to assist this group of young people. Now that upgraded assistance seems to reflect an increasing recognition that if the invasive state intervention into families by child protection systems is to be justified, then governments have both the moral and the legal obligation to devote sufficient resources to ensure that the outcomes for these rescued children are better than if they had remained with their family of origin. England introduced the Children Leaving Care Act 2000. That act was intended, quote, to improve the life chances of young people living in and leaving care and to replicate the supports 
that responsible parents would be expected to provide for their children. In short, the intention was to, to delay the transition from care until young people were both prepared and ready to leave. Now, that new act in England produced a, mix, a mixture of positive and negative results. So one key policy response to those concerns was the introduction of a form of extended care in England known as the Staying Put Program, legislated as an ongoing duty on all local authorities in England from May 2014 in the Children and Families Act 2014. So that act required local authorities in England to facilitate, monitor and support staying put arrangements for fostered young people until they reach the age of 21, where this is what they and their foster carers want, unless the local authority considers that the staying put arrangement is not consistent with the welfare of the young person. The USA enacted the Fostering Connections Act in 2008 as a form of extended care, which aimed to extend the Foster Care Independence Act by giving states the option of maintaining young people in foster care until 21 years of age. By early 2017, nearly half of all American states had taken up this option of extending care till 21 with federal financial support. Now, Professor Mark Courtney, a leading researcher in America, and his colleagues in California used a number of mixed methods in their evaluation of extended care in California. And they were able to report specific benefits of extended care, such as the following, enhanced educational outcomes, improved earnings and less economic hardship, fewer earlier pregnancies, lower levels of homelessness, reduced mental health difficulties or involvement in the criminal justice system, and greater involvement of non-custodial fathers with their children. Now, Ian Matheson argues that extended care works for a number of clear reasons, because it offers continuity and stability to young people, a nurturing environment, it helps engagement in education, employment and training. It empowers young people and it gives them greater choice and control over the timing and the process of their transition. The evidence does suggest that extended care in Australia should lead to improvements in the key areas like education and employment, housing, health, and reduced involvement in offending and criminal justice. The Beyond 18 study was commissioned by the Victorian government, and it was intended to help better understand some of the key factors of young people's experiences when they transition from out of home care. The main parts of the study were an online survey of young people who'd experienced care in Victoria and follow up interviews with those young people. And in that survey, we asked them a, a bunch of different things about their experiences of transition planning, their relationships with workers, relationships with other people, service use, and a lot of things of life about their lives in general, like accommodation, education, employment, and health and welfare. One of the things we found when we were talking about to young people about their experiences of leaving care is that we found that a lot of them had pretty patchy knowledge of the services and supports that were available to them or potentially available to them and also pretty patchy knowledge of the transition process as a whole so only one in three i think had knew whether they had a transition plan or not and many of them didn't really know what was going to happen as they left we also found that a lot of the young people in the study were leaving care with some indicators of pretty significant emotional or peer relationship issues and they also had pretty low levels of education compared to other young people their age. After they left care, so in the first 12 months or so after they left state care, we found that they had some pretty complex housing patterns. So people moved a lot. Uh, they moved between different houses or different types of accommodation and between different sort of accommodation types. So between private rentals, transitional housing and the like. 
We also found an association between their housing type and their participation in education or employment. So young people who were studying or working were the most likely to be living with former carers or living with partners. Um, and in contrast, young people who weren't working or studying were the most likely to be living in transitional housing. We also found that they had very low levels of income. Less than half of the study was earning any money from employment. And of those who were earning money from employment, I think about two thirds of those were in part-time employment. And a lot of them had experienced some form of financial distress, such as going without meals. In the qualitative interviews, many young people stated that they had limited social networks. This was a cause of distress for many participants in the interviews, many of whom indicated that they felt isolated and alone. Although some reported ongoing relationships with former carers, others had lost contact or were wary of overburdening former carers or friends with their problems or support needs. So social relationship problems had a lot of uh, a range of underlying causes like previous trauma and neglect, plus development and behavioural issues, but these are exacerbated by high mobility, like with placement and school changes, issues with conflict or bullying, especially in residential care or at school or in workplaces. There was a strong theme of the stigma of being in care and the lack of a normal socialisation was mentioned by many of the participants. Particular issues for young people from residential care included having limited opportunities to build extended social networks or engage in social life while in out of home care. Consistency and continuity were highly valued and were described as enabling young people to build relationships of trust and to gain access to support services. Conversely, inconsistent support or frequent changes of workers was described as hindering young people's ability to develop social skills or to access supports. One young woman who'd lived in residential care explained how being in care can lead to isolation or how our systems can get in the way of relationships. She says, from my experience for residential care, I feel like it's really funny because we always talk about how every resi kid knows every other resi kid, but at the same time, you're very isolated with like the outside world. You just know your services. So in their accounts, many young people hankered after more personal or flexible relationships with their out of home care and leaving care workers. They placed a higher value on good relationships and on people that they could see or speak to outside of a formal setting. And this was especially true for those who'd been in residential care. Okay, after watching those videos and, and leading into reflections and discussion with Philip and Jacinta, we'd just like you to keep in mind some of the key points from those past presentations. One of those is that even before the current situation with COVID-19, care leavers or young people preparing to leave care were already a, an especially vulnerable group with often with limited social supports or social networks. And this is clear in the education, employment, housing and economic outcomes and in young care leavers accounts of, of feeling unprepared to transition from care. We've also heard about some of the emerging international evidence of the potential benefits of extending care arrangements as well as about the importance of social networks and the benefit of more consistent and continuous relationships with peers and workers. This last point suggests that practitioners are both a part of the social support system for many young people in care or as well as afterwards, as well as being a potential in a position to help young people to strengthen or leverage their social supports. Today we're discussing this in the context of COVID-19, but obviously a lot of what Philip and Jacinta will be speaking about will also have relevance and re resonance in practice with care leaders more generally. So I'd like to now pass to Philip, who will be talking about some of these issues in, specifically in relation to the current COVID-19 situation. So thank you, Philip. Thank you, Stuart. Hello, everybody. So to begin with, current post-18 years support in Australian jurisdictions is discretionary, not mandatory. So that contrasts with post-18 supports in the USA, UK and New Zealand. We might come back to that later. But the Home Stretch Advocacy Campaign has resulted in four states trialling forms of extended care. Both Tasmania and South Australia are funding foster care placements till 21 years of age. 
Western Australia commenced a child program supporting about 20 young people in May 2019. And Victoria introduced a pilot program in May 2018, supporting 250 young people over five years, whether transitioning from foster care, residential care, or kinship care. Additionally, the ACT introduced an earlier program in 2014, providing financial and casework assistance to care leavers till 25 years of age. The other three jurisdictions, New South Wales, Northern Territory and Queensland have not introduced extended care programs to date. Now, the trials in those five states and territories have been informed by positive findings from extended care programs in the UK, USA and Canada. And there are probably three main points coming out of those evaluations. One being that more gradual transitions influenced by stable and supportive ongoing relationships lead to housing stability. Two, there is greater engagement in education and employment. And three, there is reduced homelessness, early pregnancy, involvement in the criminal justice system and economic hardship. So what are the particular learnings for Australia from elsewhere? Again, there are probably three main points. One being that extended care needs to utilise inclusive, not exclusive criteria so that we're not just supporting those young people with initial positive transitions who are committed to and engaged with education and or employment. Secondly, extended care should incorporate all forms of out-of-home care, including residential care. And thirdly, extended care in Australia must address the specific cultural needs of Indigenous care leavers who make up about one third of the total leaving care cohort nationally. Now, COVID-19 has reinforced arguments for extended care internationally. A number of international jurisdictions, for example, British Columbia and Ontario in Canada, and four American states, California, Illinois, Ohio, and Rhode Island, have extended care till at least the end of 2020. And those jurisdictions are providing the same level of support involving housing, education and finances, and social workers are involved in proactively contacting young people to ensure they take up that support. The CREATE Foundation locally have indicated that most Australian jurisdictions have pledged some form of extended support during COVID-19. Most notably, Victoria have formally assured that extended care, will, care supports will be available for those who turned 18 between March this year and December 2020 till June 2021. So those extended care supports in Victoria involve a carer or housing allowance, flexible funding and casework support. Now, those additional supports or arrangements during COVID-19 address a number of particular concerns. Firstly, we know that many care leavers face particular risks of social isolation due to social distancing requirements. Additionally, many lack support from family or community connections as noted by the Beyond 18 study and may rely heavily on professional workers. Some of the young people have mental health concerns due to traumatic childhoods. There has actually been a very interesting online survey conducted in America recently of 18 to 23 year olds in or leaving foster care, which found as a result of COVID-19, many of this cohort experienced unstable housing and food insecurity, 
lost regular employment and income and no longer had access to educational supports. So there is clearly a high need to transform in-person contacts to online and social media contacts so that their material needs, example, access to food and other essential, essential goods, including medication and housing, their educational needs and their emotional needs are met. Peer support networks, for example, via the wonderful Create Foundation, may be absolutely vital for their wellbeing. And we need to monitor and assess the support needs of all groups of peer leavers, ranging from those who might be characterised as having particularly positive transitions, for example, currently studying at university or TAFE, to equally those who, who might be characterised as just surviving, i.e. those who are currently homeless or in prison. I will now hand over to Jacinta War, who will talk about the major importance of social capital and associated support networks to support care leavers during COVID-19. Thanks, Philip. That's great. Um, right. So, um, my study on um, informal support networks um, for young people, um, or the focus of social capital essentially, um, was on the individual level, um, the individual in their community, the young person in their community. So I interviewed um, care leaders between the ages of 18 to 26 and people in their informal network with a young person nominated as important to them. I wanted to see how social capital and social support may assist in a gradual transition from state care to um, adulthood for care leaders. So this slide um, shows the overall conceptual framework which seeks to examine how social resources uh, may assist in a gradual transition for care leaders or in this time of COVID-19 to assist in reducing social isolation. So it has three critical elements. The types of um, social support on the left-hand side, these refer to a type of help that is available or provided, example, emotional, practical, informational, and so on. And then there are the concepts of social capital access, facilitation and function. Now the social in social capital is that it is ingrained in social, in the structure of social relations. Uh, the capital is its functional and access dimensions. It provides people with access to valuable resources that contribute to their well-being. And the developmental and environmental resources on the right hand side um, uh, these originate and are, and are adapted from the Victorian looking after children docket framework, as well as I believe in care literature. So uh, imagine um, these types of support from social capital and areas of need are familiar to many of you today, um, but I, so I won't explain them all, but I would like to briefly go over how social capital is being applied, because this speaks to how we can apply it in our work with care leaders now in this time of COVID-19. So social capital can be defined by its ability to efficiently help individuals to access resources through other people in the network. Um, a major function of social capital is its capacity to facilitate certain actions of the individuals within the network structure. And this is reciprocal. Reciprocity is a key social capital function in which individuals give and receive and return over time. And bonding capital uh, is when people know each other well and have a strong connection. Um, bridging capital is when people horizontally connect to new people or new ideas. Um, bonding capital assists people to get by and bridging capital assists people to get ahead. And linking capital is when people are vertically, vertically connected um, to sources of power. It also helps people to get ahead. So these notions of getting by or getting ahead are conceptually suggestive of building care leaders' resilience and helping them progress um, what could be characteristically termed a moving on position 
um, as they help the care leaders to gain access to very important developmental and environmental resources, as we can see on this slide. So there are many activities and resources that fall under these major um, types of developmental and environmental resources that will help the care leader to get by or get ahead, and we can talk about these in a minute. So these concepts of social capital and social support can be used formally. For example, it can underpin policy responses and at the service and practice level, it is used by professionals who work with young people, who work with people, young people leading care. While specialist supports as a type of form of social capital are critical for care leaders, they are not always available. So informal social capital and supports become an important goal for the worker to engage with the young person's social network, family, other caring adults and peers, and unleash what can, be, what can contribute in terms of caring and support. And we can do this by the EcoMap um, as a tool, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what I do want to actually say to you about some of the strategies that we can look at, particularly now, um, are the st strategies of adult and peer support. So in my, um, in my study, um, the young person nominated people who um, were important to them. Sometimes they nominated a former carer or casual despite carer. And these initially um, engineered relationships or statutory carers, you know, over time evolved into something more natural. But some young people also nominated peer relationships, such as friends and partners. So, and some young people inadvertently um, would talk about this existence from other people in their, in their network as well. For instance, I had one young participant who try, had tried returning home and um, after leaving care, he was about 18 when he um, turned home and after a week, um, their parent called the police um, to move him out again and this actually happened. And he was um, left on a, a train platform at midnight uh, this young person was resourceful and um, he ran his basketball coach and uh, they came and took him home to their place and um, he was able to stay there until he was um, ready to leave. Uh, so that was the person in his network um, that supported him and caring adult. Um, I had another young person who was able to stay um, with their um, foster carer um, post their official ending of their um, uh, guardianship and this support was actually very good for this, um, for this uh, young person and in fact they had that home as a secure base. Um, so if that young person um, wants to leave and um, um, and then she steps or makes a mistake, she's got a place to return to. So during this time of COVID-19, uh, this young person um, has the family support, not unlike many of her non-care state peers. So it brings me to the question of why care leaders are a group of people particularly vulnerable to the isolating effects of COVID-19, as this is an example uh, that demonstrates a very good social capital provided while in care, um, and its continuation can replicate the nurturing and positive side of um, familial social capital. The first case exemplified uh, something quite different. They could rely on their family. So um, for many care leaders, as we know, um, their parents as a form of vertical relational support has not worked out for them. And what this research shows that the negative experiences are acutely felt due to many care leaders idealised perception of these relationships improving once they leave care. So the coronavirus restriction rules, while deemed necessary, can also serve to exacerbate this already compounding psychological effect. Um, and also, Werner and Smith have also actually said that a steadfast and caring relationship with at least one adult is a protective factor for children and young people. So when we're looking at reconceptualising this sort of care through the lens of social capital, we can see the value and relevance of the everyday care work that we do with young people. And the strategy is for organisations possibly may have adult volunteers that could help to develop 
online and phone support um, for young people. Another, when we talk about peer support, I had another young person who actually talked about um, a friend of theirs who actually gave them a lot of support, but this support also was um, reciprocal. So the person that I, um, the two young people that I interviewed, they very much um, used bonding and uh, reciprocity, social capital in their friendship. Um, and that's what, we, that's what friendship is um, all about. But often this, um, uh, this concept, it's a quite an important concept because it often goes un, un, unacknowledged. And we need to, I think, make it quite visible that these small cumulative actions of positive bonding and reciprocity capital is um, very important for young people so they can see that they too are active agents in their social network, that they're not just the um, passive recipients of someone else's benevolence, but they are thoughtful members of their own social network, giving, receiving, and returning over time. So peer, you know, Philip has actually talked about peer um, support groups, uh, online support groups, what apps groups where young people could be supported to establish buddy systems is a good strategy with their peers to keep in touch, check over each other's well-being and health and provide the support as necessary. So continuing on, um, how do we find out who these people are? Now some of you may know about EcoMaps um, and you may work with EcoMaps as a moment of routine in your hope, but it's a drawing technique that enables workers to depict social and family relationships. It is commonly used for assessment, planning and intervention. And originally used as a focus for family relations, it has expanded to other social relations. Um, so its visual power brings into sharp relief the connections, themes and quality of the young person's um, life and leads to a more holistic insight of who can contribute in terms of caring and support. So we're not solely concentrating on the young person or form of services to find answers. But we can also start relying on care generated by perhaps um, other family members who they get on with or other persons in their network. It's quite a practical tool. So at the centre, um, a work, uh, worker places um, the young person's name and then draws lines representing the connections with people activities um, that a young person may do. You ask about the different types of social resources, like family or significant others, friends, clubs, sports, to find out who's in their network. It's strengths-based, um, being mindful of potential inner and outer resources. By inner, I mean their psychological, emotional, perhaps spiritual resources and the outer are the more practical, financial, um, informational supports. Um, it's important to reinforce the representations of relationships with different lines as they tell you about the quality and the intensity of the relationship. A thick line represents important um, positive connections. Um, a thinner line, a neutral connection. A crosshatch line indicates stress or conflict. A dotted line, a tenuous relationship, and an arrow or do a double arrow pointed arrow tells you about the flow of resources, the energy, or the interest in the relationship. And just very quickly, I have another example. Um, I'll go in there. And there's an example of a pretend one that I did just to sort of show you what it could look like, as you can see. The young person has a strong bi-directional relationship with their cousin in this depiction and a strong relationship with a mentor and a, a stressful relation, relationship with their brother. But finally, I just want to um, give you some other sort of practical ways. Um, and for the next couple of slides, these slides actually come from Victoria, the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. It's a peak body team in Victoria. And they gathered a lot of information from leading care specialists of the different sorts, sorts of practical things that we can do um, in this time during COVID-19. Um, so there are, you know, um, we now know that we, of course, we are able to go out and take walks with clients. We can have conversations from the driveway. 
we can be using the technology like the phone. Um, if we have a meeting with a young person over Skype, um, maybe we can actually order some pizzas or order some food to have that meeting with. Food, health and nutrition are another very important resources for young people. There's things that we can do there with um, e-vouchers for super supermarkets. We can drop off food. Um, we can do food delivery with recipes and learning to cook. We can make care hampers to young people that include the necessities and treats and there's emergency relief vouchers. And what I'm saying here is that once we actually probably know who in that young person's network, maybe we could be talking to those people to find out if they can be giving this sort of support, um, particularly if uh, professionals are not um, available at, at this time to give this sort of support. So, and there's um, some more in the way of learning, um, laptops, dongles, in the internet is very important at this point in time, making sure that young people have phone credit for their phones or needing to buy phones for them. There's activities that are um, very um, important for young people to do, particularly with exercise or maybe getting out in, into the garden or maybe even um, with uh, things like music. Um, there's streaming um, subscriptions and there's also um, if people, young people have got interests in um, books or art supplies, dropping these things off for them. So there's sort of very practical things that we can do. And this is the last slide. What's very important, of course, is that financial and practical support at this time. Um, and there's some really sort of good examples there of um, taxi vouchers, maybe online vouchers. And that last one, going back to that eco map, um, is you know, particularly if you find that young people do have to self-isolate, um, that trying to find out in their um, social network maybe who in their neighbourhood or who of their friends can help them out with things like shopping or getting medications. Right. Thank you. Thank you for those reflections, Philip and Jacinta. Um, before we go to the audience and take some of the audience questions, um, we please do invite you to have them. I have a few questions just to open up the discussion a little bit or to allow you to expand on some of what you said. So for Philip, you, you, you've spoken both in your past presentation and today about the, the benefits of extending care. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what the specific effects of extending care or the be specific benefits of extending care are for the wellbeing of care leavers in this current context? I mean, what what would extending care do for the young people leaving care in the context of COVID-19? Well, Stuart, the particular benefit is that we know at a time of social distancing that people overwhelmingly have been relying on family members close to them. So with restrictions on travelling, to buy food, to, act, to access leisure, to see friends, see networks, people have really been bunkering down, if you like, and relying if they live with mum and dad or live with their partner or their children, those close family members have been more and more important to them. Now, most care leavers don't have that family support. They either don't have it at all or they don't have it close to them geographically or they don't have positive support. So the ability to access other forms of support has been more important than ever. And I guess notwithstanding the point Jacinta has made that overwhelmingly young people who leave care with good support networks, that is informal support networks, not necessarily family or extended family, but uh, people from sporting groups, cultural groups, friends from school, maybe religious groups, all sorts of groups, overwhelmingly they do better in their transition. But we do know that some young people leave care with very few, if any of those supports. So in that current environment, the ability to access professional supports, whether it be a, a leaving care worker 
or it could be a mental health counsellor or it could be someone helping them with their continued or further education. That has become more and more important and of course then there is also that fundamental need around material support, one being actually being able to get food, which of course has, has been a challenge for everybody at times in terms of getting to supermarkets, getting beyond panic buying. And uh, then the other side of that, of course, being access to housing, which has been a massive issue for some people either retaining current housing or getting stable housing if they didn't have it in the first place. So they are major areas that would have become harder for some care leavers in the current environment. And Jacinta, I wondered if you could maybe talk about some of the possible, I suppose, effects of extending care on, on young people's social capital. I mean, whether that's in the current context or just more generally. Uh, the extent of extending care. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, well, uh, to me, that is actually extending um, their uh, social capital. I um, welcome that legislation. Um, what my what the research that I've actually done and what it says is that when those um, young people um, have been invited to actually stay with their former carer, it's those young people in the group of uh, participants that I interviewed, I interviewed nine participants, it was those people that in fact their social capital, with the bonding, the bridging, um, the mix of um, their social support of information, information support, emotional support, and um, uh, mixing that with the, the social capital, they're the people that were in fact doing very, very well. Um, they were um, uh, uh, often at um, university or they had work. They um, had a good network of friends around them. Um, they had been learning about progressive responsibility. Um, they were the, the extended care um, as a model. I think is actually very important because it's actually extending a the most that's basic, um, the classic form of the informal social capital, uh, nurturing social capital is when you have um, good uh, supportive families, um, positive family supports, and that's what the research, uh, my research was showing. Those young people where um, uh, they said to me that the most important person um, uh, may have been a friend who may have been in care themselves. Um, they, I must say, they were struggling um, a little bit more than the other people in my um, research. Um, they, and they often, in fact, had to be, get um, more support from formal organisations and, and professions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a number of questions coming in and, and time is now running short. So I might now throw it to some of the rest the audience questions. Uh, the first is, is really a sort of practical question for Jacinto, which is if you could clarify the difference between an eco map and a genogram. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, a genogram is usually when you are looking at um, the a person's family, and it's usually three generations of that family. So it's a little bit like a family tree. Uh, that's what a genogram is. So you may have mum, dad, and then the kids, and up there you may have your grandparents. So you usually actually have three generations. Now often that genogram can be part of an eco map. But the, the eco map is like the eco is short for ecological, ecological systems theory. And um, that, uh, with that, essentially, you're showing more of the relationship of that person or that family with their environment uh, around them. And that's the social environment, it can be the bio psycho environment, uh, it could be the spiritual environment. Um, and it could be uh, the environment like uh, health and employment as well. 
But what I was showing you today was a simpler version of just when you're looking at a, uh, if you've got a young person in front of you, and if you just sort of want to know who's in their social network, particularly in their informal social network. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, a question for Philip here from the audience. Um, the audience member was asking whether extending care affects relationships with birth parents, um, whether that makes you know those kind of relationships more difficult, or whether there's any benefits to that. That that's a good question, which I don't think the literature has thought a lot about, um, Stuart. Um, my hunch would be that in you know in the ideal world young people would return to live with birth parents when they leave care and in some cases that does work and it works out well in other cases it happens and it doesn't work out very well at all uh, so generally when we talk about young people that might get to 18 and leave care at that point and, and move into independent living. So they're not going to live with a, a parent or a close family member. Uh, I, I would think that the, the important things in their life are the supportive networks they've had up until they're 18, the, the key support networks, whether that be a foster carer or another carer or other key people in their life, as Jacinta has talked about. So I, I think, certainly I don't think it would hurt their relationship with their birth parents, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily impact significantly. Um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cohort, it, there, there may be some unique circumstances operating there, particularly as we know that many of that cohort, uh, when they leave care, may return to remote or rural communities or families a long way from where they were placed in care. So in, in some ways having that extension of care and certainly that option of um, having financial support extended can, can be a, probably a real positive in enabling them to return to their own communities and see whether that arrangement can work out for them. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that kind of in part brings me on to my another question for you, Philip, which and, and potentially just into two. We had we've had a couple of questions asking about how might practitioners uh, approach working with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander communities, I guess, in, particularly in the re respect to COVID-19 and, and in some remote communities where there are you know particularly strict restrictions on entry. Um, how, how can those communities or peop young people in those communities be given support or help to build their social capital? Look, I think there's a few issues there that are emanating a bit from the current national study we're conducting on Indigenous young people leaving care. I mean, one particular need of that group is to um, uh, retain and expand their cultural and community connections. And, and identity and that does mean uh, really before they leave care how important it is for, for, for connections to be established for them uh, with broader communities, with mentors, with Aboriginal community controlled organisations. That is irrespective of whether they're returning to a, a family or, or community um, of that background. Uh, in the current circumstances, whether it is practical for, say, someone who's been placed in a city or a big regional city to return to a more remote or rural community, I guess is debatable given, given the issues you raise. But I think if we're talking generally, uh, that preparation to potentially return to community and country is something for that cohort that needs to be a major part of any leaving care plan. And, and that plan is not only about linking that young person to organisations, it's also about examining what is happening in those communities and whether uh, something can be done resource-wise, 
program wise to address issues that lead to those young people going into care in the first place because the reality is um, whether it's happening in COVID-19 or not, it would be happening generally that many of the young people are returning to those communities, but there is a situation there probably unchanged from when they were removed. Uh, so that seems to me to be a part of leaving care pl planning and post care planning that there has been very little if any attention given to so far. I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time here. We do have a number of other questions, uh, most of which we will be able to put on the forum. So please keep an eye out for that. And finally, I'd really like to say thank you, Philip and Jacinta, and to everyone for attending today. As we continue to monitor the situation with coronavirus, please keep an eye out for CFCA newsletters for updates and future webinars. And with that, I thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.